Krishna Productions presents a fascinating story of one of the events in the life of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It is based on the account of Shishir Kumar Ghos in his famous book, Lord Goranga, published in 1923. The material of this book was derived from the Bengali book Chaitanya Bhagavat by Vrindavan Das Thakur, as well as from other books by other intimate devotees of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. However, it was because of the numerous and glorious books written in the 1960s and 70s by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, founder and spiritual guide of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, that the teachings and pastimes of Lord Chaitanya were well known throughout the world. Especially beneficial was his translation of the Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita by Krishnadas Kaviraj. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared on earth in the form of a great devotee of God from 1486 to 1534. However, in the famous pastime that is about to be narrated, often referred to as the Mahaprakash or Grand Revelation, the Lord reveals himself to his devotees in his original form as Sri Krishna. It is entitled, Lord Chaitanya Appears as Lord Krishna and has been specially edited by your narrator, Amala Bhaktadas. And now we begin today's story. One day, after Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had bathed, he suddenly revealed himself as the Supreme Lord Krishna. He did so at the house of Sribas Thakur. Something very remarkable occurred on this occasion. For Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, then known as Nimai Pandit, seated himself on the Vishnu altar within the house, as if it were the most natural thing for him to do. He then ordered the devotees to chant hymns. There were screens on the doors and windows, but the room was, as usual, lighted up by the mild effulgence of the Lord's body, so that it seemed as if it were filled with the sunshine of noon. Gadadhar Pandit decorated the Lord's person with flower garlands and flower ornaments. Nityananda Prabhu held an umbrella over his head. Narahari fanned him with a yak-tail whisk. Nimai, seated on a fine cushion, fascinated all by his indescribable beauty, on whomever the Lord cast a glance, felt him as much within his heart as he saw him outside it. What poets had imagined, what painters had pictured, what saints had dreamed, the elite of Nadia actually realized. They found themselves face to face with the Lord Almighty. The devotees plunged in a sea of happiness, engaged themselves in worshipping him with tulsi leaves, clothes of various colors, gold, silver, and other things. They also worshipped him with another flower, plucked from their heart, which was the flower of love. What an overpowering love they felt for the lovely being before them. They could then have died 100,000 deaths to satisfy his slightest wish. Then, for the first time, they actually learned what the four letters of the word love mean. On that day, the door was kept open, and everyone who wanted had permission to see the Lord. Those who saw Him surrendered themselves completely, for to see was to truly believe. The devotees came in from all sides, 
each engrossed with his own thoughts, each determined to do his own duty, to show his love, and to relieve his heart, a heart surcharged with an irresistibly kindly feeling towards him. Each devotee thought and realized how good he is, how incomparably delectable my Lord is. Hundreds of men and women showered flowers at his feet, threw garlands round his neck, recited mantras, and repeated prayers all at the same time. Yet there was no confusion. All were absorbed in the deity and took no notice of one another. Everyone thought that he and his Lord were the only two persons present in the room, and that he had been looking at the Lord, and the Lord looking at him. No one was aware of the noise made by the others. Many persons were speaking to the Lord, yet there was absolute peace and quiet in the house. Those present addressed him as Lord, Master, Krishna, and so forth, each in language which occurred to himself. Someone offered a garland saying, I offer this flower wreath to you. Be pleased to wear it round your neck. Thereupon the Lord, taking off the garland which he had on his neck, placed it round the neck of the devotee, and then, bending his head forward, allowed the devotee similarly to decorate him. In this way the devotees offered presents to the Lord, and in return received presents from him. But why did they offer presents to God, who is almighty and the owner of everything? It was because they felt an intense longing to serve Him, to give Him abundant pleasure. That was the manifestation of their sublime love, their overflowing devotion. After a while, they surrounded the Lord with innumerable gifts of food, delicious fruits, sweets, cakes, and milk preparations, and the variety seemed endless, certainly enough to fill up thousands of men. Because the foods were offered by the devotees with love and devotion, the Lord was obliged to accept and partake of all of them. But how could one man consume so much food? Yes, for an ordinary man it would be impossible, but for the Supreme Lord, for the All-Powerful One, it would pose no problem. So, in a short while, he miraculously ate all of the edibles there, pleasing all of the devotees who had brought them. Then the devotees gazed at the Lord, their eyes riveted on his brilliant person. His body seemed to be made up of electricity, of a yellowish-white light which, though more brilliant than the rays of the midday sun, did not hurt the eyes in the least, but so soothed and pleased them that it was ecstasy in itself to behold it. They further saw that light was emitted not only from the person of the Lord, but from everyone present there. Indeed, it was seen that light was being emitted from every substance there, the chairs, the utensils and the clothing. In fact, everything was covered and suffused with luminosity, even the atmosphere of the room. The Lord sat silent as a statue and seemed to be looking at everyone at the same time. Indeed, everyone saw that his eyes were upon him. And what a gaze it was, full of indescribable love. They found that the being before them was exceedingly good, that he was beyond the influence of evil, that he was without guile and absolutely pure. They felt that he had no misery, no sorrow, but on the other hand was swimming, as it were, in an ocean of ecstasy.
those present found in him their long-lost friend. People are always in search of something. They know that they are unhappy, ill at ease, and discontented. A single woman thinks that a good marriage will bring peace to her mind, but when it comes, it does not remove her restlessness. A poor man thinks that riches will soothe his soul. A tyrant believes that absolute power will render him secure and happy, but experience proves to them that the soul hankers after something else than riches or power. When, however, the devotees saw the Lord, they came to realize that it had been His absence that had been the cause of their restlessness and unhappiness, a state which is to be found in every person. And when they now saw Him, they felt that they had found their long-lost treasure, the mate of their soul. Persons try to find happiness in wealth, power, praise of their fellows, love, etc., but they never get it. They search for it here and there because they do not know the cause of their restlessness. Their souls are, unknown to them, attracted towards the fountain from which they had sprung, and this is the cause of the feeling of want that makes every person restless. The soul without God is in the position of a loving but bereaved wife. And what a charming friend! His beauty brought tears to their eyes. The fragrance from his body maddened their nasal nerves. The grace, elegance, intelligence, goodness, benevolence, and love that beamed to his beautiful person from head to foot began to attract the hearts of those present. The intense sweetness of the Lord can, after a while, be too much for human beings to bear, and the devotees were beginning to show signs of satiety. The Lord, perceiving this, wanted to give them some relief, so he spoke. His tone was commanding, and it seemed that he was quite conscious that there was none in the universe to dispute his authority. Yet his voice was sweeter than music, and his sentiments considerate, generous, and tender. Indeed, it seemed that he was incapable of finding fault, and that, in his opinion, everyone before him was as guileless, as good, as disinterestedly loving as he himself was. When he addressed Shribas Thakur, he showed him and others that he knew everything about him. He gave an account of some very important events which had occurred to Shribas Thakur during his life but which were unknown to everybody else. Shribas Thakur was convinced that the being before him knew all the secrets of his heart. The Lord then addressed Advaitacharya, and in a similar manner told him some of the past events of his life. Advaita was also convinced that the being on the altar knew everything about him. The Lord then addressed another and another. The day was thus passed, and night came on. The devotees, one and all, were now delirious with joy. Numerous lamps were thrown into the shade by the effulgence of the Lord's body. This brilliance, which seemed mild at daytime on account of the sunlight, became extremely bright at the approach of night. The light emitted from the bodies of the devotees, as well as from the inanimate objects around, reflected additional illumination at the approach of darkness. It then became time to perform arti to the Lord, a ceremony of worshipping Him by waving lighted ghee candles before Him. Sri Thakur thought 
that this ceremony ought to be performed by the Lord's mother, Sachi. So he addressed Advaitacharya and said, Is it not proper that the arti should be performed by the mother of the Lord? Besides, she has always been entertaining the notion that <laughs> we elderly men have spoiled her youthful son. Let her now come and see that it is not we who have spoiled her son, but <laughs> her son who is spoiling us. Advaitacharya smiled and approved of the proposal, and so Sachi was brought there. She entered the room and, seeing her son, stood speechless and trembling. She saw at once that her son was God Almighty. But did the knowledge please or gratify her? Certainly not. If the devotees found in the Lord their long-lost treasure, she at once felt that she had lost her dearest object of love. Did she not love her child, so beautiful, so full of excellences, so affectionate to her? Was it not for her son that she had forgotten her bereavements and had become the happiest woman in the world? But now she was seeing him as the father of all. Thus he was no longer her exclusive property, but a property to which everyone had an equal right. In the midst of these painful thoughts, she came to remember that she had chastised her son and treated him as an inferior. And would she be forgiven for having followed the Lord Almighty with a cane in her hand? Trembling and speechless, she was a prey to diverse and contradictory feelings, and not at all gratified by seeing her son raised to so exalted a position. As for the Lord, he took no more notice of her than he did of the others. Seeing this, Sribas addressed her, What are you doing, lady? Why do you hesitate? Go, go and prostrate yourself before him. So Sachi fell prostrate before him, whom she had up to now regarded as her son. And the being who had hitherto treated Sachi as his mother, saluting her with the humblest of submission as often as he met her, now planted his foot upon her gray head. Sachi, as soon as she came in contact with the sacred foot of the Lord, found herself violently affected. A thrill of joy passed through her frame, and she could not resist the temptation of expressing it by dancing. A dance by a Hindu lady, and one advanced in age, before spectators and strangers, was too horrible a scandal to be permitted. She was thus restrained by Sribas Thakur. Then another miracle occurred. Sachi did not know Sanskrit, Yet she uttered the couplet in the Srimad Bhagavatam, which contains the prayer of Devaki, Krishna's mother, to the newborn Krishna. Sachi, Malini, and other elderly ladies then performed the arti ceremony, and when finished, went home. As devotees would arrive at Sribas Thakur's house, they would wait on the veranda until the Lord himself called them in. No one would venture inside without permission. Mukunda, the dearest of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's disciples, was waiting for just such an order. But suddenly the Lord ordered the devotees to bring Sridhar. Sridhar was a very poor man economically who sustained himself by selling plantain leaves and vegetables. He was too insignificant a man to be known by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's devotees. So they asked who he was. The Lord gave them specific directions as to how he could be found, namely that if they proceeded in a certain direction, they would find a man loudly repeating the name of Lord Krishna, and that that man was Sridhar. As for Sridhar, who was a former object of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pranks, he had come to know that his tormentor had become a pious man and that he was regarded by many as even Lord Krishna himself. But he had not ventured to approach him. 
Now the summons came to him that the Lord God Krishna, Sachi's son, wanted him. Sridhar would have most readily come, but as soon as he heard the message, he fainted away. Therefore the devotees had to carry him to the Lord in the midst of the jeers of those who had the privilege of seeing poor Sridhar being carried on the shoulders of highly respectable men. When brought into the presence of the Lord, however, Sridhar awoke from his trance. He at first saw that it was the Brahmin youth, his tormentor, that was sitting on the altar. But he found that the youth had transformed himself into Lord Krishna. The spectacle bewildered him, and he stood speechless. The Lord said, Do you now see who took your plantain leaves by force? It is in this manner that I deal with those who love me. I show them in this manner that mine is theirs and theirs is mine. It is now time for me to show you that mine is also yours. Sridhar was not in a mood then to enjoy a practical joke. So he said in the midst of sobs, Lord, you revealed yourself to me more than once. Did you not at one time tell me that you are the father of the Ganges? But I, a fool, did not understand you. The Lord replied, Now, Sridhar, it is time for me to repay you for all the things I took from you by force. So you ask me for a boon. Mind, you shall have whatever you want for I have to pay you fully for all the plantain leaves I took from you by force. Sridhar declined positively to have anything to do with gifts or indeed to be merry. He stuck to his serious mood. Then the Lord said, You have spent days in poverty. You have served me faithfully. I must ask you to spend your latter days in opulence and power. So let me, Sridhar, make you the lord of an empire. Sridhar smiled. He smiled to express his contempt for the gift offered. He would have nothing, not even an empire, and replied, My lord, please, please do not tempt me. It is not proper that you should tempt a lowly creature like me. A poor, despised man like me has no doubt a hankering after wealth and power, but... I do not want sovereignty or anything. The Lord again offered him an empire, and again Sridhar declined. When Sridhar rejected the empire offered him by the Lord, Sridhar, the poorest of the poor, who had spent his whole life in a state of semi-starvation, the devotees there naturally raised a shout of admiration, for Sridhar had flung opulence away as a thing of no worth. The Lord was greatly pleased by the attitude of Sridhar, so worthy of a devotee, but he did not yet show it. He said, But Sridhar, you know my words cannot go for nothing. I requested you to ask for a blessing, so you must ask for one. If you don't desire an empire, then tell me what you do want. So Sridhar pondered. He had gotten everything. He had nothing more to ask for, but he also had to obey the Lord's command. So he said, Then, then grant me this. Let that young and beautiful Brahmin, Nimai Pandit, who took away my plantain leaves by force, also take by force my entire heart and and let him make his permanent home there. The Lord looked at him tenderly and could scarcely restrain his tears. He said, I knew, Sridhar, that you would treat with contempt even the offer of an empire. It was only to tempt you that I made it. It was only to show that for sovereignty People risk everything, even their future life, but the poorest of devotees would not accept it, even when offered by me. 
an empire was offered to Sridhar because he was the poorest of the poor. It was to show that bhakti, devotion, was infinite times more valuable than sovereignty. It was to show men that those who jeopardize their souls for the acquirement of property or sovereignty are foolish. The Lord had a talk with Morari, one of the chroniclers of his early activities. Morari was a worshipper of Ram and Sita. Meek, philanthropic, pious, Morari had no superior on earth. The Lord said to him, Morari, look at me. Morari looked up and saw that Nimai Pandit was no longer there, but in his place Lord Ram and his consort Sita was sitting on a throne. The beautiful spectacle was just too much for Morari, and he fainted away. The reassuring words of the Lord, however, roused Morari from his trance. Morari, I implore you, give up the study of fruitless, mystical philosophies. Morari, a little disconcerted, said, Are they not good? Do they not teach religious truth? The Lord replied, Good or bad, that is not the question. But those researches into the realm of mysticism will not lead anyone to find me. Morari, forgetting the Lord's presence, for he was after all a man, ventured to suggest that a caution from the Lord was unnecessary and there was no one to teach him mystical philosophy. But the Lord retorted, Yes, there is. You have a teacher in Advaitacharya. The fact is, the object of the Lord was not to give a lesson to poor Morari, but to Advaitacharya, because of his knowledge of the secrets of the occult sciences. So to avoid hurting the feelings of the glorious Advaita, the Lord chose to teach him by addressing Morari. The Lord then explained that to love God and to be loved by God was a goal quite distinct from the knowledge of the soul's mystical abilities. The scientists of Nadia were then deeply engaged in dissecting the soul, forgetting altogether the fact that they had another, more important duty, which was to save their souls by directing them to the lotus feet of Lord Krishna towards which all progressive beings are tending. Advaitacharya then felt himself humbled. Haridas Thakur was called next. His mission on earth was to teach humility to mankind and resignation. He had prayed for the salvation of those Muslim executioners who had tried to whip him to death in the public streets. Now he stood before the Lord, a very humble creature, with folded hands. The Lord said, Haridas, you have suffered much for me. It is now my turn to show you that I appreciate your devotion. So ask for a boon, anything you wish. The sovereignty of the whole universe is at your disposal. But Haridas replied, Great Lord, you know the secret of my heart. The more you reveal yourself to me, the more I come to realize my, my unworthiness. You, you are purity, and I, I am a lump of filth. You are good, and I am wicked. My Lord, when you speak to me in kindly terms, I am just overwhelmed, overpowered by shame. 
Let me have only this one boon, that I may never forget my own unworthiness. My Lord, if you wish to give me a boon, make me the lowest servant of all your servants. Saying this, he rolled on the ground in violent ecstasy. The Lord replied, Rise, Haridas, rise, I implore you. Your humility simply tears my heart apart. The most pleasant being to me is he who, though great, is unconscious of it. Yes, it is from you that men must learn to be meek and forbearing. So rise, beloved Haridas, rise. There is not one servant of mine in the whole universe for whom I have a greater regard than yourself. Yes, you were cruelly whipped by those wicked men, and you suffered for my sake. When they whipped you, you prayed to me to forgive them. Now it is not my way to reject the prayer of a sincere devotee. But that is not the only or main reason I did not punish your tormentors, Haridas. It would have been the easiest thing for me to have protected you from the lashes. But if I had done so, the world would have lost an example. The object of your existence is the salvation of the human race. You, a frail man, have done a deed which has no parallel you not only forgave those who were trying to whip you to, de to death, but you prayed to me to, to shower my blessings upon them. Now, Haridas, I am not one to throw obstacles in the way of the performance of so noble a deed. Yet, when they began to flog you, I thought I had a duty to perform in your behalf. So what I did, was to take you into my heart so that the whippings might not fall on your back. You, Haridas, can testify to the fact that the lash did not give you any pain. When the Lord stopped speaking, the devotees tried to express their gratitude, but found themselves overpowered. They felt very much humbled. They felt that they had up to then led a very ungrateful life by forgetting so good and affectionate a master. And they felt also that the human race was altogether ungrateful. They also felt how much the good Lord had been defamed by his ignorant creatures. They had given him a character resembling their own selves. They had depicted him as a frightful tyrant. But how good, how incomparably good he was. They resolved that if they lived through this experience, they would spend the rest of their days in only proclaiming his goodness to his ignorant creatures. The Lord continued addressing his devotees in this manner, one by one. He wanted to give a boon to whomever asked for one. He then ordered them to throw open the doors and bring everyone from the town who wanted to see him. He proclaimed, Let those who have doubts come and see. He commanded his devotees to go through the streets and tell whomever they would meet that the Lord had manifested himself and that whoever desired could come and witness him. Those who were present had no doubt that God Almighty was speaking to them, so they disdained to ask him for anything transient, such as worldly goods. The presence of the Lord had taken away from their minds any traces of worldliness. So when the Lord offered to give them boons, Almost all chose devotion, either for themselves or for their dear ones. One having a father who was a skeptic prayed that his heart might be drawn towards the Lord. 
one prayed that his son, who was a gambler, might be cured of his vicious habit. When Advaitacharya was requested to ask for a boon, he prayed that the nectar, love, and devotion which the Lord had brought for mankind from the spiritual world, Goloka, might be distributed to all, irrespective of creed, color, or caste. Mukunda, however, was weeping outside. Angelic as he was by nature, he also sang like an angel. He was an ascetic from his infancy. He was a devotee before the Lord had revealed himself. Nimai loved him, and Mukunda on his part followed his great friend like a shadow. But why was Mukunda outside? He was sitting on the veranda, a picture of utter despair. The Lord was inside, and Mukunda was able to hear every word that was being spoken there. But he was not allowed to take any part therein, because the Lord had not called him. It gradually became evident to all who were present that the Lord was deliberately ignoring Mukunda, and they pitied him. So they held a secret consultation amongst themselves, and then Shribas Thakur ventured to put in a word on his behalf. He boldly said, My Lord, forgive my impertinence, but everyone who has come here has been blessed by you except your Mukunda. The Lord instantly replied, saying, My Mukunda? Who told you that he was my Mukunda? Shribas replied, Well, if he's not yours, then whose is he? Everyone knows that he's yours and yours alone. He is the singer of your glories. Who has not been moved by his songs about you? But the Lord retorted, Yes, he is a devotee when he is in your midst, that I know. But I also know that he is a philosopher when he is in the midst of savants who teach anti-devotional doctrines. He has no firm faith in anything, certainly not in me. The angry reply of the Lord fell like a thunderbolt upon all who heard it, for Mukunda was the beloved of all, but more especially upon the unfortunate Mukunda himself. The Lord God was within. He was blessing everyone with a liberality which knew no bounds. Mukunda had heard all, he heard what Shribas Thakur urged on his behalf and what the Lord said in reply. This led him to think profoundly about his condition. At last, he broke the silence by calling out to Shribas Thakur. Do not intercede for me, Pandit. The Lord is just and my punishment is much lighter than my offense. Mukunda was quite sincere in what he said, and it was not mock humility that led him to admit his offense. Indeed, he was then in a very happy frame of mind. The remarks of the Lord had led him into it, for he felt that the Lord loved him, or he would not have spoken with such kind concern for him. He thought, yes, yes, that is his way. His punishment means only love, but I must chastise this unworthy body of mine, which has become polluted by imbibing anti-devotional doctrines. Yes, I must die, and then the Lord God will take me into his bosom. But when will that time come? When will the Lord again accept me as his servant? Then he again addressed Shribas Thakur. Please do not intercede for me. Only ask the Lord to tell me if he will condescend to do so, whether he will ever allow me to see him. The Lord seemed moved to tears by the question, but he spoke aloud this time directly to Mukunda. Yes, Mukunda, you shall certainly see me, but after reincarnating ten million times. This meant 
that Mukunda must die and be reborn ten million times before the process of purification would be complete that would entitle him to see the Lord. To Mukunda, the amount of time that he was asked to wait practically meant eternity. It was the cruelest blow conceivable for Mukunda, more especially when we consider that the Lord, who hurled the decree, was only a few yards away. But Mukunda did not view the matter in that light at all. Rather, he saw it as the Lord's special mercy on himself and proclaimed it as such. However, to the devotees there, the sentence passed upon Mukunda seemed so unusual that they felt bewildered. Mukunda was very dear to them, and so was the Lord. They felt in their heart of hearts that the Lord was dealing rather severely with Mukunda. But the idea was blasphemous, so they did not venture to express it. Nevertheless, they could not help sympathizing profoundly with the unfortunate Mukunda. When therefore he talked of the Lord's mercy after his severe sentence, they could not see where the mercy lay. Yet Mukunda had never been more sincere. Indeed, if the sentence was felt as a thunderbolt by the others, to Mukunda it appeared like a choice blessing. So he began to mutter to himself, utterly unmindful of the presence of the Lord and the devotees. Yes, how merciful he is, for I have a promise from him that he will allow me to look at him again. Therefore I am the happiest man in the universe. Ten million births may seem to be long, but there is nothing when compared to eternity. Then he stood up to dance on the veranda with uplifted hands and joyfully sang out, I shall see him! I shall see him! He has promised it! This sight was too much for the devotees to bear, and they all burst into tears. When Mukunda noted this, he was surprised and perplexed, and innocently said to them, Why do you weep when I am so supremely happy? For he had expected them to congratulate him on what he considered to be his good fortune. The golden figure on the sacred altar was taking a keen interest in what was happening on the veranda. When Mukunda began to dance and exclaim, I shall see him, the lotus eyes of the Lord began to shed tears. However, he managed to order Mukunda to come inside. But Mukunda, overwhelmed with ecstasy, could not hear the order and kept on dancing. The devotees, however, caught hold of him and sought to restrain him. However, Mukunda, disliking this interruption, said, Why do you stop me? Have you not heard the Lord's promise? He will allow me to see him after ten million births. Notwithstanding this, the devotees dragged him before the Lord, who said in a voice broken with emotion, Mukunda, Forgive me for teasing you. You have totally conquered me. Please understand that I was only trying your faith. But even, even more than this, I wanted to show the world what kind of character my devotees have. I also wanted to show that while I am the master of all, I am yet mastered by my devotees. Did I not tell you that I would not be visible to you till you had passed through ten million births? <laughs> but where, where has my resolve gone? One word of yours has driven that resolution out of me. Thank you.
Oh, no, this Mukunda, that it is not my custom to be fault-finding with my devotees, nor to exact vengeance for their shortcomings, whatever ignorant persons may say to the contrary. No, Mukunda, men do me wrong by judging me by their, their own standard. Forgiveness rather than the exaction of revenge. Yes, that, that is my nature. You know that my resolve is unalterable, and so you believe for a certain that you would be deprived of the privilege of seeing me for millions of years. Yet your faith in me, your faith was not shaken. On the other hand, the prospect of seeing me after millions of years threw you into an ecstasy. Mukunda, I have scarcely a devotee like you. Now raise your head and look at me and let us be friends again. Through the whole of that day, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in the mood of the Supreme Lord Krishna, remained revealed. Then midnight approached, and he was still on the altar, but now he assumed a different mood. Advaitacharya wanted to see the mightiness of the Lord, the same universal form that Arjun in the Bhagavad Gita had seen. And accordingly, the Lord showed himself as the Almighty in the act of being worshipped by countless demigods and celestial beings. This spectacular vision filled Advaitacharya with intolerable awe and fear. Then the Lord withdrew this glorious vision and appeared to all the devotees in His human-like loveliness, so pure and so simple. As the devotees gazed at Him, Tears of joy began to trickle down their cheeks. They felt themselves very unfortunate for having only two eyes, for two were certainly not enough to see and appreciate the Lord's unlimited beauty. So ravishing was this beauty that they had to shut their eyes momentarily for relief. But no sooner would they do this than they would have to immediately open them up for their desire to see him again was simply maddening. Then the Lord assumed another and quite different form of loveliness, even superior to that which was just revealed. Now he was Sarbanga Sundara, which when translated means beautifully proportioned being. So when the eyes of the devotees were resting on one part of the Lord's body, there they remained riveted. One devotee was intoxicated by the sweet fragrance that emitted from the Lord's body and exclaimed, Yes, yes, I now see why he gave me my nose. In this manner, they served the Lord with their five senses, and the Lord served them in return. A devotee who has any love for God is not satisfied with merely worshipping Him. He longs to worship Him through the five senses, to smell Him, to touch Him, to taste Him, to see Him. The devotees had their spiritual senses open, and these enabled them to appreciate the loveliness of God. 
communion with God is impossible for one whose spiritual senses have not been opened. For God is spirit. Ecstasy is the proof of this communion. Where there is no ecstasy, there is no communion. The devotees felt that the Lord was drawing them towards himself as an angler draws a fish. They all approached him, and some touched his fingers, some his hands, and some his feet. How delicious the touch, they exclaimed, overpowered with pleasure. The Lord held them one by one in his arms. Then he embraced them and kissed them fervently. It was then that the devotees fully realized that they were part and parcel of him, inconceivably one with, yet different from, their supreme beloved. They were totally his, and he was totally theirs. Finding the mate of their soul, time passed with the rapidity of lightning. Then a strange thing happened. Advaitacharya had learned from practical experience that the mightiness of God was beyond the conception of man and therefore painful to him. Now the devotees were beginning to feel that the overpowering sweetness displayed by the Lord had gone beyond the point of their capacity to appreciate and relish. Completely exhausted, they felt that the Lord's sweetness was killing them inch by inch. So Advaitacharya whispered to Sri Bhas Thakur, Don't you think that he should go now? I can't bear his presence any longer. Neither can I. Then, having held a secret conference, they agreed to address the Lord directly. Assuming a humble attitude, they prayed to him, O oh Lord, we are puny creatures, so we can no longer bear your sweetness. Please appear to us as one of us and relieve us of the pressure of your overwhelming presence. Twenty-one hours had passed away since the time of the Lord's revelation in the morning. He had revealed himself at about eight in the morning. It was then about five o'clock the following day. When the devotees prayed to him to subdue his glory, and appeared to them in a manner which they were more familiar with, he replied, As you wish. The Lord then entered a deep trance, ending what is called the Maha Prakash, or Grand Revelation. Whenever the Lord entered a trance, even though his devotees had become accustomed to the sight, they became frightened, for in this state he looked as if he were dead. Sometimes he returned to his normal consciousness quickly, and sometimes he did not. On these latter occasions, his attendants would hold some cotton before his nostrils to ascertain whether he was breathing or not. If he was, they felt themselves relieved and tried every gentle means to wake him. Sometimes, however, he would not be breathing, and this alarmed them greatly because they loved the Lord with all their hearts, they were naturally afraid of losing Him. Now, on this particular occasion, when the Lord had fallen into a trance, He remained absolutely motionless, and when the devotees examined the state of His breath, they were horrified to find that He was not breathing at all nor did he even have a heartbeat. His eyes were fixed, lightless, lusterless, showing only the lower portion of the pupil. However, his limbs were not stiff, 
but remained in whatever position they were placed. The only indication there was of life was that there was a warmth in the body which had the luster of the living and not the paleness of the dead. Though the devotees tried every known method to wake him, each attempt proved useless. Gradually, the devotees began to suspect that the Lord had left them for good. For what did that last embrace, that last kiss mean? Yes, he is the Lord, they muttered to themselves, but we shall not let him cheat us out of his presence. No, we shall follow him to the spiritual world. The whole of the previous day and night, most of the devotees had eaten nothing, nor had they slept nor rested their limbs and minds. They had passed twenty-one hours in a state of constant transcendental excitement. Though they had just voted for rest, and the Lord had agreed to withdraw His supernatural sweetness, how could they now go home and leave the Lord lying in that death-like condition? No, they could not and would not until they knew for certain that the Lord had returned to His own divine abode. On previous occasions, when the Lord was in a similar trance, they had also given Him up for lost, but their belief had always proved false. Therefore they now had a lurking hope that the Lord would again allay their fears by returning to physical consciousness. However, their hope did not in any way cheer them up. For as hour after hour passed, from five in the morning till two in the afternoon, the Lord's body remained immobile, apparently lifeless. Yet it was neither pale nor cold. Then one devotee said, Let us sing the songs of Kunjabanga. Maybe that will wake him. But if it doesn't, then let that be our last song on earth. This song refers to Radha's usual practice of meeting her eternal consort Krishna in a sacred grove at night, staying with him till morning and then returning home. However, one morning Radharani overslept and her attendant maids tried to awaken her with a song, urging her that it was time to go home. This attempt to awaken her was called Kunjabanga. The same idea was taken up by the devotees with rapture, for their hearts were full and they wanted an outlet for their overflowing feelings. So they slowly began their mournful dirge, which gave them some animation, some happiness. The music seemed to be celestial, and it soothed their hearts. They felt that they were receiving a flow of ecstasy from the Lord's person. Then suddenly, one devotee discovered goosebumps on the Lord's body. This showed that his consciousness had returned and that he was hearing their song. As they carefully examined the goosebumps, they noted that each bump was as large as a chickpea. Then one devotee exclaimed, He's back! He's back! Whereupon all the others shouted, Hari Bol! Hari Bol! Jai! 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 Meaning, chant the Lord's name and victory unto the Lord. As the shouting continued, the Lord opened his eyes and yawned. At first he looked somewhat vacant, but gradually he became fully animated. However, although he was no less the Lord, he again assumed the character of the Lord's ideal devotee in the mood of Srimati Radharani. Simple, humble, gentle, innocent, kind, and sensitive. 
and he would continue teaching by example how one could revive, intensify, and unify his eternal loving relationship with the Supreme Lord Krishna through the process of devotional service. Who can estimate the good fortune of those close, intimate devotees of the Lord who had had the rare opportunity of seeing and serving Him personally and confidentially? It is inestimable. All glories to them, as well as to all those who follow them in the disciplic succession, especially to His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada who became the founder spiritual guide of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness and spread Lord Chaitanya's teachings all around the world from 1965 to 1977. And all glories to the current day followers who continue to disseminate the teachings and uplift the world through the continual chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, the great chant of deliverance. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. The dramatic narration you just heard, Lord Chaitanya Appears as Lord Krishna, was produced by Krishna Productions in Los Angeles, California. It was based on the book Lord Goranga by Shishir Kumar Ghosh, which was derived from the Bengali account, the Chaitanya Bhagavat by Vrindavan Das Thakur, as well as from other books written by intimate devotees of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The project was inspired by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, founder and spiritual guide of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness and translator of the famous work, Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. The recording engineer was Halayuda Das, and the musical selections and mixing were by Vaibhavi Devi Dasi. Your narrator, including all voices, was Amala Bhakti Das.